it's a great pleasure to now introduce uh, Bob Coleman. Bob Coleman is a, a pharmacologist and independent consultant in neurodrug discovery uh, with a particular interest in incorporating human biology into the R&D process. Over 30 years experience at Glaxo, he was uh, one of the co-founders of our Pharmagene, uh, the company first formed uh, focusing on human tissue. And uh, he's currently involved with the Safer Medicines in, uh, Trust. So it's a great place to be. Thank you, Glenn, very much. And uh, thanks to the audience. My goodness, there are a lot of people here. Um, <coughs> right. Ensuring safety and, effic and efficacy of new medicines. Well, that's what I think probably everybody here at least uh, is or certainly should be interested in. The question is why do I want to, to humanize the process? Um, pretty simple really. Um, fundamentally because the recipients of the drugs that we are developing are human. Therefore I would like to tailor one to the other. Um, it's not quite as simple as that. My um, fairly extensive experience in the pharmaceutical industry has reinforced this view. Um, I have been involved in many programs where uh, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly related to the discovery end rather than development, where animals give highly divergent results. Uh, these have been used in, in certain cases, I would say perhaps cynically or through ignorance or carelessness, to identify either effects that the experimenter wanted or to eliminate effects that they didn't want to see. Um, but ultimately, of course, this all comes out in the wash and that's not a very good scientific approach. Um, so even while I was working at Glaxo and doing um, a, a lot of work in, in animals, I was also doing ever more work in such human models, in vitro models, as, as existed and I could get access to. So, um, I truly believe that the ideal, it may be totally unrealistic, but I do believe that total, uh, is a true ideal would be to test for adverse effects of our new um, potential medicines in people. Now, I realize there are practical and ethical issues associated with this, and this is not um, a, a realizable objective at this time. So let's just step a little bit back from that. What would be a realizable objective? Well, potentially using in vitro approaches, in vi human in vitro approaches, if those human in vitro um, technologies could be satisfactorily demonstrated to uh, reliably predict the things that we, are, that we are trying to investigate. The problem is we really don't know how, uh, how valuable, how useful, uh, in vitro testing, human in vitro testing can be because nobody has really looked. Bits and pieces here, bits and pieces there, but no one has really taken uh, the, uh, a really systematic approach to it, and I should be coming on to this in due course. Right, so let's now see what do we know. We know that the pharmaceutical industry is in dire trouble. It has been now some considerable time, and whatever they do doesn't really seem to help uh, the issue. Uh, and essentially it's all about increased expenditure and decreased successful output. Uh, and such things as industrial consolidation, which is going to be the answer, in fact probably overall just makes the situation worse. Um, and it's undoubtedly true that new safe and effective medicines are getting harder to find. Um, and I'm not suggesting this is the whole reason, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't presume, but uh, one element in this is that uh, animal tests cannot be relied on um, to predict clinical response. I'm not saying that they never do, but they can't be relied on. And that is the problem. And when you're looking at something that you don't, you don't know quite what to expect, and then you go and test it in something that you don't know its predictive power, what is the value of the output? Um, and finally, of course, the, uh, the approved route uh, of testing drugs has changed really li little in essence over the past, I don't know, half a century or so. Now, let's now move on to things that um, at least some people think they know. 
For example, no new drugs would be possible without the use of experimental animals. If we didn't have experimental animals, we wouldn't have any new drugs. Now, this is stated categorically. And I'm going to come back to all these points. I'm not going to elaborate here, though I will in a minute. Um, and animal-based safety tests are, are really not that bad. Um, uh, most clinical safety issues are idiosyncratic in nature, so how could you possibly expect to be able to do a little bit of in vitro work and, and, uh, and, and, and identify them? And um, however much you may want to apply alternative methods, really, there are very few validated methods that are available to us, and, you know, just too bad. Um, and, of course, you can't recapitulate in vivo complexity using in, uh, in vivo complexity using in vitro constructs. Okay. Um, and where alternatives are being actively pursued, and this is something that uh, I certainly have experienced quite um, clearly in the UK, um, there are organisations who are looking at alternatives, even if it's more reduction, refinement than replacement, so still we're focusing on, let's say, inappropriate biology, but with a more of a view on, on the welfare of animals, rather than the welfare of your potential patients. Um, this is being done by, you know, authorised, respected bodies, so just don't interfere, just leave it alone. It's a very patronising sort of attitude. Um, now, um, I now go through these points one by one. No new drugs without experimental animals. Well, we had drugs before experimental animals were widely used. Um, and uh, uh, there are examples even of uh, drugs in the, uh, in the exp ex experimental animal era that have been discovered without the use of, of those animals. Um, I'm not saying that exp animal experiments haven't been done, but they were not critical in identifying the activity uh, of, those, of those compounds. Um, this is the UK uh, Department of Health position, stated in 2012, without the judicious use of animal studies, we would have no modern drugs. Now, I find that statement absolutely ludicrous, because if tomorrow it was made illegal to involve any animals, does that mean that the whole of the pharmaceutical industry would shut down, it would stop working, they would direct their attentions elsewhere um, to other ways of doing what they do? Uh, they would. We are, um, we are a species with um, ingenuity and capability, and we would put that to the, to the task. So I, I find that very simplistic and highly misleading and actually rather insulting. Um, in the UK, we have uh, an organisation called Understanding Animal Research. They used to be called Research Defence Society. Their role, I think, is to um, uh, communicate the, the, the importance of animal experiments to the public. And I don't, in, in that respect, I think where those animals are important this is a very worthy approach, because I think the public needs to be informed. We've been, you know, we've heard about this, but they need to be informed appropriately. And here is a, a statement from them, which I find overall somewhat misleading. Uh, most of the med medicines that we have come from animal research. Uh, well, they involve animal research. Often, science doesn't need to use animals. Well, that's interesting. Uh, but for many key questions, they're crucial, possibly. Um, they will help, now this is where they get a bit uh, definitive, they will help millions with conditions such as cystic fibrosis, uh, Alzheimer's disease, spinal cord damage, and, and, and malaria. Now, uh, cystic fibrosis is a very good example. Cystic fibrosis is a, is a, is a, uh, involves a single gene mutation. Delta F508 is the most serious form of the disease. Animal models in which Delta F508 has been expressed do not have the human disease. And drugs which one supposes would be useful um, in treating human disease would have absolutely no value in, in those animals because they are, it's not reflective of the human disease. The human disease is, a, is primarily a lung disease. I'm not saying it's only a lung disease, but it's primarily a lung disease. That is what kills people. Um, in mice, the lungs are fine. They have alternative channels which do the job. It's a gut disease. Animal-based studies are, uh, are, really, uh, are really not that bad. And the MRC, the Medical Research Council, again in the UK, considers the use of animals to be essential in biomedical research in order to better understand the living body and what goes wrong in disease, and to develop safe and effective ways of preventing those diseases. Well, that's true, but uh, potentially of the animals that are, uh, that are being used. But again, you're assuming that things
things that go on in one species go on in exactly the same way in another species. They can, in fact, be highly misleading. And uh, Lord Robert Winston, a very well-known scientist in the UK, has actually put forward um, a bill for Parliament which is suggesting that drugs should all have a label indicating that these drugs have been tested on animals with the purpose of um, informing public how important animal tests are. But this is entirely illogical. All those, the drugs, I won't deny that the drugs that he, uh, uh, that he is talking about will have been tested on animals, but if we just take ourselves into a parallel uni uh, universe where it is deemed essential that drugs are in fact, any successful drug must be pink before it is allowed to go into the clinic, all drugs would be pink. So he could then come up with a statement saying it's absolutely essential that all drugs are pink, or, or taste like blue cheese, or have any other feature. If that's an essential element in the process, well, of course, every drug would express that particular element. Um, so, uh, somewhat illogical. Ah, now, if animal safety tests are not that bad, um, this is um, uh, a bit of a problem because animal safety tests, the species that we widely use, um, either one, I mean, I'm thinking primarily about rodents and dogs, one or both of them tolerate very badly or even find toxic various of these food substances. Now, these are things that we take, well, we don't all take them every day, but I think some of you will enjoy some of these, some of you won't like them very much. I mean, Brussels sprouts, I suspect that, uh, I don't know, maybe it'd be 50-50. But nevertheless, I'm not sure that many people died of uh, Brussels sprout intoxication. Um, and uh, the, as I say, these things are perfectly harmless to us and very enjoyable, um, yet uh, experimental animals would give a different answer. So if the same rules were applied to the availability of foodstuffs, then um, I think we would miss out on a lot of, lot of treats. Uh, most clinical safety issues are idiosyncratic. Therefore, you, know, you can't really expect to be able to um, study them in, uh, in a few isolated tissues. Now, this is an interesting statement from this particular paper by the Utrecht, um, saying a major impediment to the study of mechanisms of um, idiosyncratic drug reactions is the paucity of valid animal models. Um, these are responses that occur in, let's just say, a minority of human individuals. Yet, there seems to be this pull towards, we've got to do animals, we've got to do animals. What is the point of looking at animals that only, uh, for an effect that only occurs in a minority of human individuals? It seems perverse to me. So I, I, I don't really take that as a good reason not to be looking at uh, um, human-based approaches. And now, um, uh, validated few validated non-animal uh, alternatives. Now, there are some, uh, uh, some non-animal alternative methods, uh, and some of those involve human-based systems that have been uh, scientific validated, and some of these are accepted by the regulatory authorities. Um, a lot of those that um, involve human tissue are, are skin-based, and there's still an awful lot of um, effects that we're all interested in uh, examining that are not represented in, a, in, an approved, in an approved test. But what do we really want from an approved test? And this, I think, is um, a very key question. It's something that, uh, that concerns me greatly, uh, is that we have uh, organizations whose job it is to validate new tests, and they are taking these tests uh, and, and they are putting them through the mill and seeing if they will answer all the questions that are required of them. They don't do things and uh, indicate uh, issues that are, are non-relevant. Um, so does a new test tick all the boxes? Well, I think that is rather demanding, com considering that the tests we're currently relying on have never undergone such evaluation. These are things we've used because they've always been used. Okay, they may have been refined and there's some level of validation, but not to the level that, for example, ICVAM and ICVAM are subjecting them. Why don't we think rather, is a new test at least as good as, or ideally better than, an existing one? Or it might be a combination of tests. But that is more relevant, surely, because scientific advances are not made in single leaps. They're iterative processes. We move forward a bit at a time. 
And I'm not suggesting that we should be able to replace any particular poorly performing animal test or inadequately performing animal test tomorrow with, um, with a, a human in vitro test. But that is a direction we should be moving. And we should be moving in a stepwise approach, an intelligent stepwise approach. <clears throat> Impossible to recapitulate in vivo systems using in vitro constructs. Well, um, this is, uh, I, I would agree with this, I think we will never um, build a true human body, and particularly bearing in mind the variation that there is in the human body uh, just around this room, let alone around the world. And uh, um, I use the uh, example here of this, of this motor car. Clearly, it's, a, it's more than the sum of its parts, and it would be very difficult um, just to take a, a, perhaps a few of those bits and try and test the functioning of the, of the full vehicle. However, there are things you can do, and you can model parts of that car by assembling parts of it and testing them. Um, and in the same way, if you want to learn to fly, there's no need nowadays, actually, to leave the ground. You can go into a simulator. This isn't an aeroplane, but it does the job to help you train. Now, if we could be clever enough to develop some simulators, so human-based in vitro test systems, then maybe we can do this. And what sort of tests would these be? And we heard this morning the, the, the question of a body on a chip. This sort of uh, model is, I truly believe, going to be absolutely pivotal in moving towards more intelligent, more human-based, therefore relevant, safety and efficacy testing. And I'm not going to go and say any more about this. I think it's, I think it's brilliant what is being done, but uh, this is not the time nor the place. Um, and there are other, other t technologies, all these groups... Um, and I just mentioned a few here, and this is, uh, I'm not excluding other companies and other organizations, and I, I apologize to anyone who feels they should be represented and, and isn't. But there are all sorts of companies that, that, that offer their technologies, which can all um, add to this in vitro, human in vitro approach. So, <clears throat> this question, I come back now to, to validation. The question of as good as or better than, how can we establish that? It requires some properly designed and controlled studies in which we compare outcomes. Now, we already have um, a very extensive wealth of information on the outcome of animal-based preclinical testing because that has all been submitted to the regulatory authorities for drugs which go onto the market. <clears throat> so the question is, those drugs have produced whatever profiles they did in preclinical testing. Um, and have then gone to the market, then they will produce whatever profiles, assuming they, are, they do go into the market and, they, are, um, uh, and they, they, they reach the patient, then we will also have clinical information and we will have some idea as to the shortcomings of the animal tests. The question then is if you apply um, human-based in vitro approaches to those compounds and see whether those, that approach could have, produ could have produced a better result. And this is a, essentially how I believe it should be done, or a way of doing it. Um, so first of all, you identify a group of, uh, of drugs that have achieved regulatory approval, so they've been through the mill, over the hurdles, whatever you want to say, um, and have come out with a, a relatively clean bill of health, so at least sufficient that the drugs get marketing approval. They go onto the market and they have caused adverse drug reactions in patients. Now, for each of those drugs, if you can then identify a structurally and or um, uh, functionally similar compound that does not exhibit, that, that, that has gone into the market, has gone into people, it is a drug uh, that doesn't produce the same adverse effects, then these drugs can go forward as pairs. You've got a bad guy and essentially a good guy, and they go through together. All these pairs should then be submitted to a range of tests and then see how they perform. It could be that we don't get anything out of this at all, but that is the basis, I believe, of a powerful study to evaluate in human in vitro approaches. And it's the basis of uh, the Safer Medicines uh, Trust proposal. The study itself is um, outlined in poster 524. It won't be in your books because it was a late... Um, a, 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 um, admission, but the poster is in the poster session. If anyone of you would like to see that poster and talk to me about it, I'd be very happy to, to chat about it. Um, Safer Medicines Trust, who are sort of supporting me here, are a UK-based charity, and their aim is to improve patient safety by um, 
policy, mod um, modifying the way that we assess safety and to increase a more human, to, to, um, to a, more, a more human focus. Right. There is all sorts of, oh, there are all sorts of reasons for increasing our, our human focus in drug submissions. Why do these not happen? And if you ask the pharmaceutical industry, they'll tell you that regulators demand animal data. Well, why would we do that when we're going to need animal data and we've got to do it? The regulators, on the other hand, when you ask them, say, we'd be happy to review non-animal data, human-based data, if only the pharmaceutical industry would present those data to us. This is a classical vicious circle, and we need to work out how to break out. Who moves first? Um, now, a little bit of history, following on from some of the things that David said. In the 19th century, cotton production was considered only viable because it um, involved the slave trade, slave labor. And they said, we'd like to do this, but really, if we didn't have slaves, you'd have no cotton. Well, it wasn't true, and legislation forced a change. In the UK, Clean Air Act absolutely transformed the, the, the quality of the air in, in the UK. London was a no-go area in the winter. Um, people were just dying walking down the streets with the smog. It was appalling. Uh, legislation has sorted that out. It's now a clean place to live. Well, relatively. Um, <laughs> the air is, air is much nicer. Um, Health and safety at work, in, uh, again, in the UK, dramatically reduced the number of workplace accidents. Did the uh, industry itself insist on this? Of course they didn't. Legislation forced them, kicking and screaming in some cases, but nevertheless forced them. The evolution of the motor car in terms of safety, fuel efficiency, and environmental pollution. Did the car companies do this off their own bat? They did not. Legislation has forced it. And, of course, the reach in cosmetics directives. These are just some examples. In each case, it is actually being forced to do something. Legislation. So, why no change in medicines, research and development? Because no one wants to take responsibility in case things go wrong. There's no pressure from reg regulation for, for anything to change. You can't be criticised for failure if you follow instructions, even if those instructions are outmoded and outdated and, 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 and frankly misleading. Again, no pressure from regulation for it to change. In fact, the pressure from regulation maybe comes with not to change. In vitro skin uh, constructs, as I referred to briefly earlier, have achieved regulatory approval. A number of different constructs are, are available, um, and they are used by drug companies to identify possible skin irritancy. Um, but those companies largely, if not totally, still rely on animal data as well in their drug submissions. Better be safe than sorry, belt and braces. Again, no pressure from regulation to say, look, you've got a new approved test. Why are you doing animals? You should not do it. It's unethical. So, who should be responsible? We all should be responsible. Absolutely everybody. Uh, patients, clinicians and governments, and I lump them together as society, should not accept second-rate medicines. There should be incentives, I believe, for academics and industry to actively explore and develop better methods of uh, safety testing. Industry, of course, should work very closely with the regulators, and governments should take notice and encourage regulators to insist on more effective methods. Um, I suspect that um, President Obama is not in the audience, but um, I, I think that you know, the government representatives need, do need to take some note of, of this. If we wait for change to happen organically, we'll wait forever. So ultimately, someone, someone with power has to move first. Governments have power. And they need to be talking to the appropriate bodies, particularly industry and the, and the regulators. So my final slide, who should be responsible? Um, I, I think that speaks for itself. Thank you very much for your attention.